Hi everybody, welcome back to another AP Biology video. In this video, we're going to be tackling AP Biology topic 5.1, which covers the process of meiosis. Having just finished the previous unit where we discussed mitosis, some students may find that there are a lot of similarities, but also very important differences between these two processes. So as we go through this process, take note of the things that are similar, but keep in mind how these differences play into the creation of gametes overall. The first thing that we're going to talk about when we get into this topic is actually concerning the number of chromosomes that we find in cells in the first place. So when we talk about cells, one of the ways that we can describe the chromosomes that exist within these cells is through the concept of ploidy. So ploidy is a term that refers to the number of complete sets of chromosomes that we have in a cell. And when we look at cells, we have two different types of cells that we can distinguish between when we're looking at humans. So humans and other animals will have one type of cell that is called a haploid cell. A haploid cell has only one set of chromosomes. So they have half of the full genetic information that an organism has in most of its body. We find haploid cells primarily as sex cells, gametes or germline cells so that when they fuse together to form a zygote, we end up with our diploid cells. Our diploid cells are the ones that we find in the rest of our body. These are what we would term somatic cells. Mm -hmm. Diploid cells have two complete sets of chromosomes that we refer to as homologous. So homologous chromosomes are pairs that are similar in size and shape, and they carry the same genes. So you might have a chromosome that carries the genes for eye color. Eye color itself has many genes, um, but we do have different forms of this same gene. You don't have just one type of eye color, you have many different types of eye colors. So will these chromosomes, these homologous pairs may be similar. They do differ in terms of which of the alleles for a particular gene they carry. So each of our homologous chromosomes is going to contain one chromosome from our father and another chromosome from our mother. So they are the result of the fusion between those two haploid sex cells, that egg and sperm. Now, this leads us into the main theme of this unit, and that is the processes involved in sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction is when we have two parents and they give rise to a single offspring that is unique, genetically speaking, from both of them. So involved in the different rounds and things that go into sexual reproduction, we have mitosis, that process that we discussed in the previous unit, where we have cells that give rise to two daughter cells that are identical to the parent cell. And that's all well and good when we need to grow and develop and heal wounds. But when we need to go and create offspring, if we still had those same types of cells, we would just continue to accumulate chromosomes from every generation. So we need a new process, a process that is going to take us from having a diploid cell to having haploid cells that can then go into that next stage and create their own offspring. So this is the process that we are going to be looking at today that we term as meiosis. Now, two gametes that were formed via meiosis 
can fuse together. And that is through the process of fertilization, bringing it full circle. So these two haploid sex cells can fuse together to form what we call a zygote. And that zygote almost immediately starts that process of mitosis once more. And we get many cells and eventually a fully developed offspring. So let's talk a little bit about what goes into the process of meiosis. You should remember from mitosis that we do have a phase in which our cells exist where they are not dividing. This non-dividing phase where we are preparing to divide is known as interphase. Now during interphase, our cells grow, they duplicate all of their organelles, and they replicate their DNA. They make everything that they need to go into this process with the ability to divide and survive at the end of the process. So let's say that we have these two homologous chromosomes from earlier. These homologous chromosomes contain what we call a centromere. This is the center part of our chromosome. And this is actually how we count the number of chromosomes that we have. So we have here one and two different chromosomes that make up this homologous pair. When these chromosomes go to replicate, each one of the homologs will replicate independently. So we will end up with two replicated chromosomes that are still a homologous pair. You'll notice that these two chromosomes still share their centromere. They're not separated yet. So we still count this as being two chromosomes or one set of chromosomes. So now that we've got these replicated chromosomes, we can use some different terms to distinguish between our homologs. If they are members of the same replicated chromosome, they are now termed as sister chromatids. So these are identical to each other. Your sister chromatids are going to be identical because they are replicated from the same chromosome. And then the two non, um, the two that made up the original homolog, those we can refer to as non-sister chromatids. Now we only undergo interphase once for the process of meiosis. And so once we've replicated our DNA and we're ready to divide, we enter into meiosis proper. Meiosis can be broken down into two rounds of cell division. We have meiosis one, which we term as reductional division because we're reducing our ploidy by separating our homologous chromosomes. And this is allowing us to go from that diploid cell to two haploid daughter cells. And meiosis uh, doesn't get just one round of cell division. We get two rounds of cell division. So after meiosis one is complete, we enter into meiosis two, which is, is equational division. We're maintaining equal ploidy by separating our sister chromatids. In this case, we're taking the two haploid daughter cells from meiosis one, and we are dividing them once again, producing four genetically diverse or unique haploid gametes. So we're going from this one diploid parent cell to four haploid daughter cells by the end of the process of meiosis. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk our way through both meiosis one and meiosis two, as the different phases are very similar to those of mitosis. As 
stated previously, meiosis one has steps that are very similar to mitosis, but we see some major differences start to arise when we look at metaphase one and anaphase one. So we will start uh, at the beginning, like we started with mitosis, in that we had prophase. So this is prophase one. Our chromosomes have condensed from chromatin into the chromosome structures. They start to become visible. This is when we can see our genetic information. Our uh, centrosomes, which are our specific organelles that aid in the division of our nucleus, they start to produce those spindle fibers and they um, are going to prepare to latch on to our centromeres. Also during this time, the nuclear envelope that is holding all of our genetic information, that's going to break down and our nucleolus is going to disappear. So at this point, we're really dealing mostly with just what's going on in the nucleus. Once we've condensed and we're ready to go, our cells will start to align themselves along the metaphase plate, that equatorial point within our cell. And so we've got our homologous chromosome pairs lined up at that metaphase plate and we're going to have each one of the spindle fibers attach into the centrosome of our, sorry, centromere of our homologous chromosomes. And so this is going to allow us to then be pulled apart during anaphase one. So during anaphase one, those um, spindle fibers, they are going to shorten and that is going to pull our homologous chromosome pairs apart. And at the same time, we've got some other spindle fibers that are lengthening, that are causing the cell to elongate and preparing for us to pinch off into those two daughter cells. So as uh, the chromosomes arrive at opposite poles, then we're going to have that cytokinesis. So our cytoplasm will divide. And in some cases, we may have the reformation of our nucleus, but because we're gearing up for another round of division, we may not always see the full redevelopment of that nuclear envelope and the nucleolus. We may even stay as chromosomes rather than decondensing back into chromatin. But if they do, and in some cases they will, um, if they do, they will at the start of meiosis two condense back down and lose the nuclear envelope all over again. So now that we've gone from one ha uh, diploid parent cell to two haploid daughter cells, we're ready to begin the process of meiosis two. In meiosis two, each of our haploid cells that we've produced during meiosis one, they're going to divide and we start once more with prophase. So this time we have prophase two. We get new spindle fibers in each of these daughter cells that are going to emerge and they're going to prepare to line us up and pull us apart. So that will lead to metaphase two. This time it is the sister chromatids that are lining up along that metaphase plate. And each sister chromatid gets attached to a spindle fiber. So we want to ensure that this is a tight attachment because otherwise some things may go wrong. So once we have all of our sister chromatids lined up along the metaphase plate, we're ready for anaphase. Anaphase, 
apart and away. We are going to pull those sister chromatids apart. And once again, we have these non kinetochore microtubules that are lengthening our cell and preparing for that cytokinesis and the formation of our four daughter cells. So once anaphase has pulled those sister chromatids to opposite ends of our cell, we get telophase. So we arrive at the poles and our nuclear envelopes will begin to reform around our chromosomes. We will start to decondense those chromosomes back into chromatin. And we are left with those final four haploid daughter cells. Now, through these processes, you may have noticed, as I stated at the beginning, that there are some similarities between mitosis and meiosis, but uh, very important differences. For instance, mitosis is just the one process of division, and we are separating those sister chromatids from the very start. And we are producing cells that are identical to those of our parent cell. But meiosis, doesn't undergo just one, but two rounds of division. And this leaves us with genetically unique cells that have half of the genetic information of their original parent cell. So let's go through a couple of these really important differences so that we are able to tell these two processes apart. So, when we look at mitosis and meiosis, the first thing that we uh, can differentiate is the number of rounds of division and the rounds of DNA replication. So both mitosis and meiosis have one round of DNA replication. They both undergo the process of interphase once, replicating their DNA to allow for the daughter cells to get half of that original chromosome. Now, as we have previously established, we have two rounds of division in meiosis, but only one in mitosis. And this is how meiosis is able to have the uh, amount of DNA that exists within these cells. So at the end of the day, mitosis is going to produce two daughter cells that are identical to the parent cell and this helps us to grow and develop and repair different parts of our bodies so they make up the majority of our body cells but meiosis occurring in these germline cells are going to create those cells that have half of the genetic information they're going to be relatively unique compared to their parent cell. And this is also that as we fuse, we can create this offspring that has a mix of both parents' genetic information and can go on to hopefully have some unique attributes that neither of the parents had when combined. Now, I did mention as we went through the process of meiosis, that having a tight uh, attachment to our spindle fiber is very important. And the reason that that is important is because if we don't, we could have some rather disastrous effects. And what I'm talking about here is this concept of non-disjunction. Non-disjunction is an error that occurs when either during meiosis one or meiosis two, the chromosomes don't separate as they're supposed to. So if we don't separate, we may end up with daughter cells that have too many chromosomes or not enough chromosomes. And so what we form in this process is called aneuploid cells. So aneuploid is a general term that refers to either too many or too few chromosomes. You can have a cell that has an extra chromosome, 
you can have a cell that has missing chromosomes. And for these cells, we have different effects. And because there are so many genes on a single chromosome, you have a myriad of different things that can go wrong. One of the most well-known examples of a non-disjunction event is that of Down syndrome. When someone has Down syndrome, they will have an additional chromosome at chromosome number 21. So we call this a trisomy 21, referring to that it has three copies, like a tricycle. We have uh, three chromosomes. And this can create all sorts of different effects in the offspring. So it is very beneficial for our cells to be able to regulate and to ensure that those spindle fibers are firmly attached prior to the division within our cells. Of course, as we get older, this machinery and these mechanisms, they get worn out and it becomes more likely for these cases to happen. We're going to look at in the next topic, a case of how we're able to create all of this genetic information and variety that I talk that I've talked about in this video. So I will leave it here for topic 5.1 and I will see you guys in the next one for 5.2 where we discuss genetic variation and meiosis.